Hello. Can you hear me? Good. I'm going to start. Everyone here? We expecting anyone? Uh, they'll trickle in. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joseph Warren, Associate Professor at Stony Brook University. And before I introduce uh, his, his topic, I want to give you a little bit of background on Joe. Um, when most people think of Joe Warren, this is what the rest of the world sees. And um, I don't know, uh, not bad. So pretty cool. Uh, I met Joe when I was an undergrad at Southampton College. Um, he started there my senior year. And uh, he had a pretty cool lab, which he shared with uh, Chris Gobler, a uh, laboratory I was working for at the time. And uh, Joe has really cool toys. And when he wasn't there, this is what people would do. And the person that's pushing that is none other than uh, Dr. Christopher Gobler, um, who is, well, this is going to be some good fodder for Joe, and uh, who is that undergrad student that was inside? Um, <laughs> oops. Uh, so his appointments, uh, after uh, he did a postdoc uh, with Office of Naval Research, um, and he was at the Fishery Center in Woods Hole. Uh, he started at Southampton Uni uh, College of Long Island University, and then he moved to Stony Brook University and coincidentally never changed his physical address. How is that possible? Uh, Long Island University just kind of kicked out the Southampton campus and Stony Brook caught it. And so uh, Joe, along with uh, former student here, Brad Peterson and Chris Gobler, uh, were cluster hired and they may still maintain their, uh, their offices and laboratories at Southampton College and the campus, which is now uh, part of Stony Brook. Uh, he got his BS in engineering at Harvey Mudd, pretty, pretty swanky, um, PhD uh, from MIT in Woods Hole, um, under the advisement of uh, Timothy Stanton and uh, Peter Wiebe. And so the title of his talk today is Bioacoustical Ecology, 
using sound to study ecosystem processes from the mesopelagic Gulf of Mexico to the coral reefs of Jamaica. So please uh, join in welcoming Dr. Joe Warren. Thanks. Oh. Can everybody hear me? Thanks, Jeff. I uh, really appreciate the invitation to come down here and speak with you all. Um, especially uh, being invited from Jeff since I was, you could argue, partially responsible for the closing of his alma mater, which is, uh, you know, somewhat traumatic. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about sort of three broad areas of my research, two of which were in the title that Jeff just showed, and uh, the other is going to be uh, dealing with these guys, the charismatic megafauna of several different locations in the world. Uh, my goal is my talk will be this graceful arcing uh, breach, uh, but there is the chance it might just be a belly flop. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about baleen whale foraging ecology, and uh, I am not a whale scientist per se. I study zooplankton and fish, and so I'm going to be discussing how studying the food that these animals eat in conjunction with uh, the animals themselves offers us insight into their behavior. And I'll start off by talking about some of the threats to those animals. Then we'll move a little more, more closer to Dauphin Island Sea Lab uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, looking at uh, the movements and uh, estimating abundances of members of the deep sea scattering layers. And then at the end, uh, there's uh, a shift to passive acoustics, where we listen uh, to the ecosystem and try and make some sense of it. And I will warn you right now, there is a quiz for the audience during that portion of the uh, talk. So flee uh, when those slides come up. Um, lots of different collaborators on these projects, and anytime you're working with charismatic megafauna, there's permits involved. I have never had a permit to do any of my stuff, uh, so I depend on these people uh, who handle that aspect. So the three whales that I'll be talking to you about are the humpback whale, uh, the right whale, and the blue whale. So humpback and right whales are about the same size. Right whales are really fat. They're about twice as massive as a humpback whale. Uh, and then there's the blue whale, which um, is the largest animal ever on our planet, unless you talk to uh, resident expert Braden Quirk, uh, who happens to be my 12-year-old nephew, who argues that there's a dinosaur that was bigger than a blue whale. So uh, I leave you to investigate that on its own. Um, one interesting fact or feature about these animals is using aerial photography, you can get a fairly good estimate of the animal's length. The mass of these animals is actually pretty difficult to quantify. You can't put them on a scale. You can't put them in a bathtub and use displacement. You've got to use some of the best data is from the whaling era uh, when people were harvesting these whales in Antarctica and elsewhere. So there's a lot of uncertainties in how massive a blue whale is. And I'll talk about that a little bit when we get into some of the energetics of these animals. Uh, all three, or two of those species, the humpback and the blues, as well as fin whales, say whales, brutus whales, a couple others, are rorqual whales. Rorqual whales are characterized by their pleated throat grooves, um, which are seen here. So these animals take a giant gulp of seawater, which hopefully contains fish or zooplankton. Then they strain the water out through the pleats, and they swallow the food. Uh, in contrast, we have the right whales, which are also a baleen whale, but they feed in a very different strategy. They do something called ram feeding, where they just swim around with their mouth open uh, at a fairly constant rate. And they're feeding on very small animals, uh, copepods that are a few millimeters in length. So those animals aren't going to be able to escape even a slow moving whale. And every now and then they'll close their mouth and take their giant tongue and kind of scrape all the copepods down into their mouth. Uh, most of you, uh, depending on where you grew up, probably went to a high school with more students than there are right whales, North Atlantic right whales. Population's right around 500, I think it's 530-ish right now. Uh, National Geographic, a couple years ago, published this essentially a yearbook photo. This was every known right whale, um, North Atlantic right whale at the time. Uh, so they're a very small, very endangered uh, group of animals. Uh, in contrast to animals like the humpbacks, uh, how many people know that the East Coast United States humpback population is no longer endangered? It got delisted about two weeks ago. Um, there are still some subpopulations that are characterized as endangered, but the East Coast animals are no longer endangered according to NIMFS. 
They're still a protected species under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, so don't go harpooning them. But humans are pretty dangerous to all of these whales. Ship strikes account for up to one half of the right whale deaths, and lots of different whales show prop scars from interactions with vessel propellers. There's also a big problem with gear entanglement, particularly for right and humpback whales around New England. There's many different fishing gears, gill nets, lobster pots, black sea bass pots, where these animals end up entangled, and annually one out of every four animals has an entanglement in the calendar year, they estimate, and up to three quarters of the population shows scars or marks of previous entanglement. So this is a very important problem for these animals. I always say I've been fortunate enough to participate in baleen whale necropsies. People who are downwind of me may not think I'm very fortunate, but I've had firsthand experience in looking at some of these effects on these animals. Long Island gets anywhere from three to seven on average baleen whales washing up, usually dead on our beaches. And so working with the Riverhead Foundation, which is our local marine mammal stranding network, I help them out occasionally when they need. Again, not an expert, I'm just somebody who doesn't mind cutting up whales. So this was a gear entanglement issue. This is a humpback whale. This is the upper jaw of the animal, so it's kind of lying on its head, and we've pulled off the lower jaw. And these are the baleen plates that the animal uses to filter out its food. And you can see this is a rope belonging to a set of net. The nets were actually hanging out of the animal's mouth. And it's basically a horrible, horrible flossing where this rope has gotten caught all the way down on both sides of the plate. It's actually worn a groove in the upper palate. So this gear has been on this whale for quite a bit. It had a pretty deep scar or laceration on its right pectoral fin as well. So that animal washed up dead. Presumably having that net and rope entangled in its mouth had a negative impact on its feeding ability. This was a 60-foot fin whale that washed up on the beach. That's me in my fin whale necropsy outfit. This animal had a four-meter long bruise on its dorsal side, which is an injury consistent with ship strike. We've also had whales where the skull has been crushed, and again, those are evidence of being hit by a ship. Some people might ask, how do you know it was hit by a ship while it was still alive? Maybe it just died, and sometimes these animals float and can get hit by a boat. This is straight from Law and Order, or CSI. If you're dead and you get hit, you don't bruise. But if you have a bruise, that means blood was pumping while that injury occurred. So the main goal of this research is to try and better understand whale behavior so we can minimize these negative anthropogenic interactions. And if you're a whale, one of your major activities, in addition to socializing, reproducing, is feeding. And so my sort of role in this is to look at the foraging behavior of these animals. How do we do this? Well, we put instrumented tags on the animals. They're basically iPhones. Well, they're not iPhones, but they're similar to an iPhone in size. They get placed on the animal's back with a suction cup, and the tags stay on from anywhere from two minutes to 24, 48 hours. These tags record information about the animal's orientation, position, accelerations. Some tags have video or acoustic sensors. When you were coming in, that was a video tag from Jeremy Goldbogen's lab that got placed on a blue whale off Chile, and it got right behind the blue whale blowhole, and it's just kind of a cool view of an animal that you usually don't see. From the tag data, we can recreate, I call these roller coaster plots, where we can look at the animal's orientation and its movements underwater. And so this offers us key insights into what the animals are doing when we can't see them at the surface. And one thing I'll talk about later is for the baleen whales, the rorquals, we can tell when they do a feeding lunge. Because when you open your mouth and swallow a huge gulp of water and fish or krill, you slow down because you've got this huge jaw acting as basically an air break in the water column. So we can look at the velocity and acceleration and flow noise data and basically tell when these animals open their mouths underwater, which will tie in with the prey data shortly. 
Uh, so traditional methods for measuring prey, and this is fish or zooplankton, involve going out and doing net toes, uh, which are great. You get physical specimens. You know the species that are there. You can measure them. Uh, problems with net toes are they're an integrative measurement. You know when you put the net in the water. You know when you take it out. Uh, and some point in between there, you caught these animals, but you don't know their exact position. Uh, you can get better resolution on animal position using camera or video systems. For the most part, these are very small sample volumes. Often, if you're looking at zooplankton, there are a few milliliters in, in volume. So in terms of uh, surveying a water column very quickly, um, you're, you're limited in those regards. So the instrument of choice that I use is uh, active acoustics or fisheries echo sounders. Uh, similar technology to the depth finder or the fish finder that you'll have on any boat. It sends out a ping of sound. That sound travels through the water column. It bounces off stuff. We record the echo that comes back to the echo sounder. And then my job is to convert um, those echoes to something that's biologically meaningful, like number of animals per cubic meter, calories per cubic meter, something like that. That's an ecological um, variable. Uh, this is some of the gear that we use, a tow fish with several different echo sounders. Um, and as, as a good acoustician, we always do some type of ground truthing using net and video because we, we have to know what the species are down there in order to do this conversion properly. So I'm going to show you several of these uh, types of graphs, so I just want to walk you through them. Uh, this is what I call an echogram. So our boat is traveling along the surface, hopefully. Uh, boats floating is good. And we're traveling along here, and every second or two, we're sending out a ping of sound. That sound travels down through the water column and bounces off stuff. Obviously, the seafloor is a big target, so we always get a really strong echo from the seafloor. This color scale is essentially strong, medium, and weak echoes. Uh, where you see white or the light blue grays, that's weak scattering or where there's not much in the water column. And then this is a school of herring uh, in, the, in Alaska out by Juneau. And the redder values represent more fish uh, per cubic meter. So again, my, my whole process is we go out in a boat, we collect survey data, and we do a lot of math to try and do this conversion of acoustic backscatter to something that's ecologically important. And I've had master's students whose theses were those three, those four box entirely. Um, so it's, it's a really complicated uh, process. But if we know how big the fish are, we know how, uh, what type of fish they are, we can convert this color scale to numerical densities. So the reds are probably 10 herring per cubic meter. Uh, the yellows are around one herring per cubic meter. So shifting gears, now we're going to look at right whales feeding in Cape Cod Bay. Um, copepods, they're feeding on very small copepods, so we actually have to use a very high echo sounder frequency, 710 kilohertz. Most people never use that system. It's limited in its range, so it's really only useful for detecting small uh, scatterers in shallow habitats. But what you can see here is the blues in this color scale represent around 10,000 copepods per cubic meter. And you can see that the majority of the copepods are in the upper five to seven meters of the water column. We can overlay the path of a right whale on that. And you can see that this right whale did one dive down to around 18 meters. But for this entire period, which is around two and a half hours, uh, 95, 97% of its time, it was operating in from the surface to about a two meter depth. The tag's on the back of the animal, and a right whale's mouth is probably another two, maybe three meters in vertical extent. So this animal is basically moving up and down continuously and sampling that um, five to seven meter layer of copepods. And so with my colleague Susan Parks at Syracuse, we identified that these whales are spending uh, all of their time when they're feeding at or just below the surface. And one of the issues here is how many people think they can see a whale in this photo? Hands up. Can anybody see a whale or evidence of a whale? OK, how many people can see there's two whales there? Because if I showed you a photo in four more seconds, there's a second animal right next to the first. 
And so this is one reason why these animals are very susceptible to ship strike. When they're feeding just below the surface, if there's any kind of chop on the water, you can't see them. So uh, when we were analyzing this data, I was looking at the data and making these graphs. This black line is the whale movement, and this is a curtain plot of the echogram. And I went to a right whale meeting, and I said, oh, these copepods are everywhere. So all our analysis is just going to be in the vertical. We're going to ignore the horizontal uh, dimension. Well, that wasn't a very good idea. Um, because the more we looked at this data, the more interesting features we saw. So these are plots of these tagged right whales where it's basically a blimp view. So we're a top-down view of the animal's horizontal movements. We know they're staying at the surface in the upper few meters. And you can see that there are obvious behaviors in these paths. These animals uh, go back and forth over the same area multiple times. Uh, sometimes they're moving in straight lines and then they shift to these behaviors. So the question is, can we get some information into these, about these animals, either searching strategies or how they exploit these prey patches? Um, my argument is that uh, right whales are smart Roombas. So that's, the, that's a smart Roomba. Um, most oceanographers in echo sounder surveys are dumb lawnmowers. We go out and we just do a lawnmower pattern and then we tell you how many, how many uh, animals there are. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in and show you the data from the tag uh, for kind of this section where the animal is searching. And then I'll move over to this section where we think the animal is actually exploiting and feeding. Um, and I'll start off by saying there's not a speed change in the animal's velocity during this entire period. It's kind of kicking at the same fluke rate and traveling at uh, a few knots. So I'm going to show you several of these plots. We've got the depth of the animal here. Uh, we have its pitch, which is head up, head down. We've got its roll, which is side to side. And then we've got heading or yaw, which is the animal's compass bearing. And on the heading, I've overlaid these red and green lines, which represent basically 180 degree turns. So green, just like your buoys on the water. Red is left turns, green is right turns. Um, so here the animal is moving straight, here's the animal is turning. So we're going to look at two minutes of data here where the animal is uh, searching or transiting. And you can see that there's not a lot of change in its depth. Uh, its pitch is varying uh, very slowly, its roll is varying very slowly, and the heading is fairly constant. So this animal is just swimming around. Now we're going to move and look at two minutes of data where the animal is presumably feeding. So we're at this section in our graph. And here we see very different behaviors. So the animal is doing a constant up and down excursion of maybe a meter, meter and a half. And at, what's really interesting is its roll is also doing this. It's doing about a 20 degree or so side to side roll with every fluke stroke. Now whether that's an artifact of how the animal swims or if it's the animal trying to rotate its mouth to maybe get a little more food we're not sure of. Um, and there's the heading information. So what's interesting about this is we can in theory if we believe this, if we believe that these 180 degree turns are to exploit prey patches, we can pull out whether the animal is feeding or searching just from the tag. And that's really helpful since we don't have to follow the animal continuously while we do this. We can just look at the tag record and pull out actual behaviors of the animals. And you can see that over an hour and 20 minute period, this animal was continually uh, foraging for several paths. Then it would move over, exploit, exploit, exploit. Here it's searching come back and exploit. All right, so in this 10 minute period, this animal did four U-turns. So if we just look at the depth or the pitch or the roll, can you guys guess where this animal did its 180 degree turn? Is there some cue in the animals? I, I'm not showing you heading because that gives it away, but is there another pattern that we can see? Anybody got any ideas? I, I had to stare at this for much longer than 10 seconds that I've given you. So, And I cheated and I looked at the heading data. 
But for three of these turns, this whale does this little hiccup as it ascends. So here it ascends to the surface and it doesn't turn. Here it actually slows down its ascent slightly when it starts its turn. So it actually starts turning before it gets to the surface. And it does that in three of those four turns. Um, so again, why, why do we care about this? Well, instrumented tags are more expensive than just time depth tags. And time depth tags, we can put on the whales and keep them on for longer periods of time. So maybe we can get some of this behavior just from the depth record of the animal. And you know, that's a trade-off as a scientist. Do you put out one $10,000 tag or do you put out 10 $1,000 tags? Um, these animals, 15 meters long, um, you know, on the order of 34, or 50, 60 tons. Um, they can do a 90, uh, almost 180 degree turn in 90 seconds. And they can do a 90 degree turn in 15 seconds. So that's, that's a pretty impressive ability to uh, reposition itself. Um, and it's not a violent activity. These animals just are, they're pretty squishy. So they actually can bend themselves quite a bit when they turn. So this is sort of the final thing about right whales I'm going to show. Um, this is the echogram. And if you stare at these long enough, my colleague Susan pointed out that it looks like there are maybe some gaps, empty spaces in the surface layer where there's fewer copepods than you see other places. And we can look at the spacing of these. And these are somewhere around 30 meters separation. Uh, we don't have one-to-one -one data. We're never on top of the whale with our echo sounder. So the only thing we can do is say, well, the, the empty patches in our echogram are at this scale. And this is the scale of the animal's sort of feeding paths, where it does about eight of these passes in about 200 meters. And so on average, these feeding paths are about 25 meters apart. Although in some places, they're much closer. And in other places, they're much further. So this is, is certainly not conclusive proof that we're seeing the wake or the, the feeding, the areas that the whale has fed, but it's consistent with that, which is really, and now when I get to the blue whale stuff, I'll show you some data that also makes that argument. Uh, so we can quantify the prey around these feeding animals. Uh, we can get some clues for the context of specific whale behaviors and um, we can come up when we analyze our prey data where these animals do a U-turn when the prey densities are around two to five thousand meter or two to five thousand copepods per cubic meter. Uh, previous work using net toes has shown that these animals don't open their mouths to feed unless there's at least a thousand copepods per cubic meter. So Mayo and, and uh, Marx found that 25 years ago. Now I'm making the argument that they'll turn around and come back to a patch if there's two to five times that kind of uh, minimum feeding rate. Um, several caveats. Again, uh, anytime you're doing tagged studies, we have nine different whales with a total of 115 U-turns. So it's a fairly small, uh, well, it's actually a fairly big right whale feeding tag data set. But if you talk to anybody else on the planet, it's a very small N. So we're going to shift gears. We're going to move to Australia, where we were looking at humpback whales that feed, uh, have plasticity in their feeding, where they're feeding on krill schools or baitfish schools. And uh, we were doing our prey measurements from the focal follow boat. So we're putting suction cup tags on humpback whales uh, with some Australian colleagues and then mapping their food. So I'm going to give you a crash course in scattering physics. Uh, and what we have here is how strong your echoes are versus the frequency of sound that you use. And so for an animal like a euphausid, uh, the lower the frequency, the less scatter you get. And at a certain point, you reach a frequency where it doesn't really matter. Any higher, you get the same amount of energy back. So if I had a two frequency system, say 38 kilohertz and 120 kilohertz, and I had a patch, an echo that was weaker at 38 and stronger at the higher frequency, that would be consistent with backscatter from a euphausid. Animals are bubbles. So animals, fish are um, animals with bubbles inside them, or some fish are. Fish have swim bladders, which they use for buoyancy control. And in the acoustics world, a fish's scattering, if it has a swim bladder, is dominated by the swim bladder. So those bubbles produce resonance scattering. 
And for the most part, at lower frequencies, you get more backscatter from a bubble than you do at higher frequencies. So again, if I go out and do my survey and I find patches where I have more backscatter at the lower frequency than at the higher frequency, that's consistent with fish backscattering, or swim, swim bladdered fish backscattering. And so our system used 38 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz. I'll show you um, when we get to the Gulf of Mexico uh, data using the 18 and 38 kilohertz. So if we have multiple frequencies, this lets, uh, this lets us do some level of species identification. Does it work in every system? No, there are certainly places in the ocean with many different scatter types that are abundant. But if you have a system where there's only a handful of objects in the water column, we can do a pretty good job of identifying it. So here I've built filters that show up white when it detects krill. And this is our fish detector filter. And here's an echogram. So this is 38 kilohertz. We have really strong uh, scattering at 38 kilohertz. Those schools show up as fish. Here, this is a krill layer, uh, 40 meters thick at the surface, and that's detected by our krill detector. Um, you can see there's some issues. We pick up engine noise with our fish detector sometimes, but these work fairly well. And what this uh, allows us to do is we can convert the backscatter to numerical densities of animals. So here are two krill aggregations, uh, very different in their volume. This is a very small. This is maybe one mouthful for a humpback whale, maybe two mouthfuls. This is several hundred mouthfuls of a whale. Um, similar prey densities, and we can convert that to energy densities knowing how, much, how many calories a krill has. Fish schools tend to be much smaller, tend to have fewer fish in them, but they tend to be richer energetically. So if you're a whale and you have the option of catching a krill school or a fish school, which are you going to choose? Fish, right? There's more energy, more bang for your buck. Well, as, are there any fishermen in the audience? Is it easy to catch fish? Not for me, I'm terrible at catching fish. Because fish can swim much faster than krill. So the thing we're not including in here is the capture efficiency of these animals. And we can do some estimates and say that you're gonna capture 95% of the krill in a given volume of water and 60% of the fish. These numbers, by the way, are completely made up by me. Uh, we don't have any real good data on what capture efficiencies are for these feeding animals. Uh, with increased use of the camera tags, we may be able to get that kind of information, but right now these are basically hand-waving gestures. So if we compare the krill and the fish in terms of the energy density, uh, the capture efficiency reduces that to maybe a factor of two, and our observations from the tag data shows that if you're feeding on krill, you've got to spend more time feeding. You're doing more lunges per hour, but those lunges probably aren't as energetically costly as a lunge required to capture fish because the fish are going to swim away. So where we'd like to go with this is figuring out how many gulps does a whale have to do every day to get its basal metabolic energy needs. And these animals only spend part of their uh, annual time feeding. Oftentimes they're in places where there isn't food and they're reproducing or doing other things. So they've actually got to eat more during the feeding season than to just meet their basal metabolic rate. Okay, we're going to shift gears and move to the blue whales in the Gulf of Corcovado. This is about halfway up on the west coast of Chile. Um, massive aquaculture operations in this area, farm-raised salmon as well as mussels, and it's an important foraging ground for blue whales. Uh, I became involved in this project this year in 2016. In 2015, they were putting out tags on the whales, and these whales were incredibly skinny. You can actually see the vertebrae on this animal. And again, here's a mother and calf, and um, hopefully you can see that you can actually see kind of the bone structure of the animal. That's very unusual. Uh, blue whales are really big. So we're gonna have really big error bars on kind of their energetic needs because we don't know how much they weigh. But they probably need to eat somewhere between one to 10 million krill per day. Uh, and obviously more if they're feeding a calf or trying to store blubber. So we put out instrumented tags. Jeremy Goldbogen's lab put out these video tags. 
We had acoustic tags from Woods Hole. We also did some net surveys, and they are eating this euphousid, fairly small, 15, 16 millimeters in length. So the biggest animal on our planet is eating something that's a couple of grains of rice big. So here I'm going to show you a bunch of echograms, and then I'm going to overlay the dive path of the whale on those echograms. And the thing to keep in mind are kind of the red blotches here are probably somewhere around 10,000 to 50,000 krill per cubic meter. The yellows are probably 1,000 to 5,000 krill per cubic meter. And I'll have this scale bar here, uh, which represents 10 minutes in most cases. So here we have the dive path of a whale. It goes down, it travels through the layer, comes back up, goes down, comes back up to the surface. Um, I was hoping uh, last night to actually get the lunges um, plotted on these graphs, but I ran out of time because I was working on a proposal. Uh, but my guess, based on other data, is those lunges are going to occur just after the whale gets to the minimum of its dive, turns back up towards the surface, and that's when most of these rorqueral whales do their lunges. And so we were able to uh, stay with this whale for most of a good chunk of the day. You can see that this animal travels down, and it very rarely goes beneath this layer of krill. And this leads us back to a really important basic ecological question that we don't know the answer to, which is how do baleen whales find food? How do they detect where food is? From the right whale data, from this data, their behavior suggests that they can detect these edge gradients, but we have no proof of what sensory mechanism the whale is using to, to determine that information. And there's a couple of uh, contenders, um, but we really don't know uh, how they're doing it. Uh, here we are getting towards dusk, and so all you guys who are taking biological oceanography know about diel vertical migration. So the krill are moving up towards the surface, and the whales are no longer diving deep. In fact, their dive depth depths continue to match uh, the krill layers. This is a different whale with one of Jeremy's tags on it. And so again, uh, we see this behavior where the animal is spending most of its time doing multiple uh, up and down dives in these layers. Um, I will point out, again, we are not on top of the animal. These whales go down for 12 minutes, and it's really easy to lose a whale um, in those 12 minutes. So our boat is steaming around trying to stay with the whale, but we're not always on top of the whale. Except this one time, so I'm going to zoom in on this dive here where the whale looks like it starts coming up, and then it decides to go back down again. So this is the whale's dive path here. This red line right there is actually in our echogram. So that's the blue whale directly under our boat, or fairly similar under our boat. And most likely, it hears our engine and has decided it's going to not come up right underneath a vessel. Um, or at least that, that's my explanation of that. I actually have no idea what the whale was thinking, but that's what makes sense to me if I'm a whale. Um, so that's another issue we have with our sampling is we don't always want to be right on top of the whale because we might be changing the whale's behavior. Um, you also don't want a whale that's bigger than your boat coming up underneath your boat. That, that I can tell you is a fact. So this is some very rough preliminary data. Um, energetically, we're talking about these whales needing 100 to 500 gulps per day of, of krill. Um, and if they're doing one gulp per dive, uh, they're not going to get that if they fed continuously for 24 hours. So most likely they're doing multiple lunges per dive, and uh, it's dependent on all sorts of things, prey density, prey depth, the capture efficiency, and the whale's metabolic state. Okay, shifting gears entirely. Now we're going to go to the deep ocean, the Gulf of Mexico. This is a project with Kevin Boswell at Florida International University as part of the Deep End Consortium. Um, I'm going to show you data from some of the post-spill NERDA sampling effort, as well as some data from the deep end cruises, which have occurred over the last two years. Um, our sampling gear is a little bit different. Uh, this is a large transducer pod with an 18 kilohertz, 38 kilohertz, 70 and 120 transducer on it. This is off the Point Sur. These two transducers, in addition to needing a forklift to move, allow us to see down a mile into the water column. So I'm going to show you data from essentially the surface 
to 1,000 meters deep. And we can only see that deep if we use these lower frequencies. We also use a big net system. This is Tracy Sutton, head of the Deep End Consortium, inside the Mach 10. So that's a multiple opening and closing net system. It's got six nets. So we can actually do vertical stratified sampling of the water column. Uh, and I'll show you some data where we actually targeted different layers with this net. Um, and it barely fits through the A-frame on the point sir. Uh, one cool thing about the Deep End project is they process things on the fly. They've got three to four taxonomists at scopes uh, analyzing the fish as they come up, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and there's a variety of amazing deep sea creatures. Uh, we have some amazing photographers who come on our cruises as part of the outreach effort. Go to the Deep End website. There's some amazing photos, uh, including uh, the largest uh, angler fish uh, ever captured. They just set a uh, record for that at a whopping six inches in length um, for that particular species. <clears throat> so we're using these two frequencies to look down into the water column. And by looking at the differences in the backscatter between those two frequencies, we assign that scattering to a taxonomic group based on the animal's physiology, whether it has a swim bladder, how big the swim bladder is, whether it doesn't have a swim bladder. So crustaceans and small fish without swim bladders get lumped together in our analysis. Does that make sense genetically? By, or not genetically, does that make sense by species? by trophic function? Not sure, but this is what our data provide. Um, we have large non-swim bladdered fish, we have swim bladdered fish, and then we've got an other category where stuff is either other animals or maybe multiple aggregations of those other things. The net toe analysis, um, to work up everything can take years, so I'll, I'll show you some quick and dirty stuff we've done on the cruises. So some of the data that we see, um, 18 kilohertz in red backscatter, uh, 38 kilohertz in blue. This is over the course of a, a three week cruise. And you can see that during the dawn, day, dusk and night periods, we have changes in where the backscatter is in the water column. So these animals are definitely moving up and down. These are graphs where for different stations where the color represents daytime and the dashed line is nighttime backscatter and this is the dissolved oxygen profile and you can see throughout our survey grid the scattering layers occur at the do maximum near the surface presumably which is where their prey are located and then the daytime uh, depth where the scattering layer resides is almost always at or near the oxygen minimum which if you know basic physiology might make sense. If you have a lot of animals at a particular spot in the water column, they're gonna be breathing and maybe reducing the oxygen there. We can look at how over the course of a day uh, between the three epipelagic, upper mesopelagic and lower mesopelagic zones, the distribution of backscatter between these different groups varies. And this, this graph is, is one way to look at it and I may come back at it I've got a movie that shows this, but one of our key findings for this was one quarter of the deep scattering layer wasn't migrating. Now, whether that's uh, a certain species of fish isn't migrating, or if it's one out of every four fish isn't migrating, we're not sure of. We need to look at the net tow data um, to figure this out. But this is an animation of a day's worth of scattering. So we have our crustacean, small non-swim bladdered fish, uh, large non-swim bladdered fish, our other category, and then the swim bladdered fish. And so you can see the movement of those layers um, up and down, and we're trying to make sense of this as we speak. So Tracy let me run one of uh, the mock toes. Normally we do the mock toe cast at specific depth bins so we can compare all our different sites to each other, because you want to have standardized sampling. Well, he decided Mach 26 could be my boondoggle, and he let me pick the depths uh, where we would open and close the nets. So I looked at our echograms. This is 18 kilohertz, this is 38 kilohertz. And I picked the depths that were gonna sample some of these specific layers. So for example, this is net three that's gonna sample this layer that's very strong at 18 kilohertz, 
And if you only had a 38 kilohertz system, you wouldn't even see it. So we're trying to figure out what's composing net three. Again, this is on the boat. I just take photos of our sampling trays. Um, so it's a very qualitative uh, analysis. But net three is the only net that had substantial numbers of these fish. And this is Valencia nellis. It's a type of hatchet fish. And again, as an acoustician, I don't see these as fish. I see these as swim bladders surrounded by muscle. So we measure the swim bladder size and then we can run theoretical scattering models to predict what we should expect to see in terms of the backscatter from these animals. So if we look at our measurements, the difference in backscatter between 18 and 38 kilohertz is negative 66 to negative 80. So it's a minus 14 dB difference between those two frequencies. This blue curve is the theoretical, a mathematical model predicting the scattering from the Valencia Nella swim bladders that we measured. And we get minus 16 dB. Uh, if I change my swim bladder size by about a, a millimeter, it was like five to seven millimeters. And if I shift it to four to six millimeters, I can match that number exactly. Um, but I didn't do that, but I could. So, you know. Uh, and what we can do is I can then tell you that that layer if it's composed entirely of those Valencianellas, has a numerical fish density of around, uh, I always screw this up because it's fractions, it's one fish for every two to four cubic meters of water column. So that gives you the, an idea of the spacing of these animals in what we would call, looking at that echogram, a dense thick scattering layer. And these are you know, small fish, these are 15 millimeter, 20 millimeter fish. So in some cases, we can identify the source of the backscatter and quantify the abundance. And the things we're working on right now are trying to figure out things like transport of energy uh, in the food web that occurs. Um, and the data that we get from the acoustics is at a much finer scale than any other sampling system. So it's really kind of powerful. Okay, we're gonna shift to the quiz portion of the lecture so people can flee now. All of you are passive acousticians, whether you know it or not. Because you guys, if you hear <laughs> at 5.30 in the morning, you know somebody in your neighborhood has a rooster. So you have done remote species identification by only listening to the environment. Okay, so that's, that's basically what passive acoustics is. We'd like to know the source of the sound, and that can be either an animal or in some cases it can be a specific behavior. So I'm gonna play you, I think, seven different mystery noises, and you guys are gonna to have to guess, or I'd like to hear a guess, of what you think these animals might be. Um, the first three are from Shinnecock Bay, which is a uh, coastal lagoon, barrier beach ecosystem on Long Island. Our recorder is in about a meter and a half of water, so a very shallow system. Anybody got a guess? Submarine. Not a submarine in a meter and a half ecosystem. Dr. Valentine. Brad Peterson. Uh, no, his regulator sounds more like a whale when he's done. <laughs> so this is a toadfish. So you guys probably can hear these around here. One interesting thing, if you listen to the second toadfish call that plays, there's actually a second toadfish that jumps in and people think this is a disruptive behavior. So these are mating calls saying, hey, I'm a toadfish, hey, I'm a toadfish. Um, so listen to the second one where you'll hear a second guy jump in. So that, ba -ba that's a second toadfish trying to screw up the first one. Okay, our next mystery noise, again, same location. Ivory billed woodpecker, right? That's that's from down here. Right? Any guesses? So all of these, yeah, these these this. Well, I guess I could give it away and tell you it's a fish. Um, yeah, this is them resonating their swim bladder. Um, that's a cusk eel. So those guys make those calls.
Sounds like the hunt for the red October, right? The worm drive. Wait, have all the grad students seen the hunt for red October? It's with skinny Alec Baldwin. It's pretty good. You should watch it. And Sean Connery. Any guesses what that is? Good guess, not a ship engine. That's actually a construction site on Dune Road, home of Calvin Klein's mansion that's pile driving. So that's about a kilometer and a half away. And I can guarantee you these guys did not file any permits for introducing sound into the marine environment. Whereas if they were pile driving in the ocean, they would have had to. So that was an interesting random discovery. And my grad student got scared when I told him to go take photos of the construction site. OK, how many people here know what that is? All right, how many people think it's a dolphin? Raise your hand. You have all been lied to. That is not a dolphin. Everybody thinks it's Flipper. That's the sound that Flipper, the TV show, played. That is what that sound is. It's a sped up kookaburra call. So if you've ever heard the kookaburra sitting in the old gum tree song, that's what a kookaburra is. Um, and the flipper noise is a sped up kookaburra. TV, don't believe it. OK, so the next set of sounds I'm going to show you are there's an artificial reef off the coast of Long Island. We were hired by the state to monitor whether these reefs were serving as fish aggregation devices. And as piggybacked on this, we put out a passive recorder, and we got about a week's worth of data. So these come from about 50 feet of water, about three to four miles south of Long Island. Any guesses? Yeah, that's what a dolphin sounds like, or that's one of the sounds a dolphin makes. So that's a whistle. They use that for communication. Any guesses what that is? Not, no, not a snapping shrimp. That's a good guess. So there were there are whistles in the background. There's actually some boat noise in the background. And I convinced myself that was actually gunshots. Uh, so this was late at night, and we certainly have fishermen and law fishermen are retired cops, and they go out there and throw cans in the ocean and shoot them. So I was I had convinced myself that was gunshots because I couldn't think of anything else that it would be. My grad student, who's obviously much smarter than me, um, looked at the literature. That's dolphins again, and they make this sound. It's called a jaw clap. And so that doesn't sound like a natural sound. It sounds like guns going off, but that's a jaw clap. So there's whistles, but then there's also that pop, 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 pop. Those are echolocation clicks or burst pulses. So again, those are dolphins. And that uh, gives us an idea that they're actually actively foraging on the reefs. So we can look at the occurrence of dolphin calls. So the red dots represent, again, this is a week when we heard dolphin calls. And the black dots represent just sort of the overall noise level in the ocean, which is dominated by fishing boats. So there's a lot of recreational fishermen and also party boats that come out here. And you can see a regular peak in the day, in the middle of the day for most of that, and the weekends, obviously, a lot more boat traffic. And so one of the findings, so we never saw a dolphin when we were out there doing boat surveys or diving surveys out there. So one advantage of the passive stuff is we actually detected a species that we wouldn't know was there otherwise. Um, and the dolphins, this is midnight, noon, midnight again. Dolphins are out the reef throughout the day, unlike boat traffic, which peaks around sunrise, and tails off as fishermen get drunk and go back to shore um, in the late afternoon. So these animals, meaning both humans and the marine mammals, are utilizing this reef at the same time. And there's probably some ecological interactions. So we have blackfish, black sea bass, and cunner on this reef. The human fishermen are targeting the adult sea bass and blackfish. And the foraging dolphins are feeding on the cunner and the juveniles of those species. So there may be some ecological interactions there that we need to take a look at. 
Last thing I'm going to talk about is some stuff we did down in Jamaica. So one of the things, one of the challenges, right, is I, we just play these noises and we have to figure out what they came from. And if you can't find somebody else who heard a noise that sounds like yours, you're kind of lost. So we put out video cameras with our recorders in several different environments to try and look at some of the different behaviors. And this was in conjunction with Brad Peterson and John Carroll, who's now at Georgia Southern, who were looking at herbivory rates on uh, seagrass beds there. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. It played when I practiced. All right, sorry about this. So watch this second fish come in. Did you hear that? That snap? So we can actually figure out where that bite occurred and this is what the bite looks like acoustically. So this is the waveform and this is the spectrogram. Um, and most people on the reefs think the dominant sound that's a short snap like that is a snapping shrimp. And in some parts of the reef, that's definitely the case, where there are a lot of sponges, for example. But on the grass beds, we're not hearing snapping shrimp, we're hearing herbivory rates. Uh, you can also hear goatfish uh, do this digging in the sand behavior, and I call it a body slam, where they kind of swim down and scrape the surface. So we can actually quantify what those things look like acoustically. And what my lab's working on right now is building detectors for these things. And one of the things we could do with these detectors, this is just a, uh, a click detector. So we're not differentiating between herbivory or snapping shrimp, but we're, we're hoping to get there. So this is over a five day period and you can see a strong diurnal signal where we have lots of clicks at night, not a lot of clicks during the day. And that pattern, this is a boat that came through that screwed up our, our detector. So if we go to a different site that's fairly close by, same bottom coverage, we actually get a completely different pattern where we have a minimum in clicks at midnight and a maximum during the day. So we either have different sound sources there or they're behaving differently. And now we're trying to make sense of that. So, Okay, so conclusions. Active acoustics can give us information about predator-prey relationships for some of the largest animals on our planet. We can look down a, meter, a mile deep in the ocean with one meter vertical resolution and 10 to 100 meters horizontal resolution. So we get an unprecedented insight into the movements and uh, of the deep scattering layers. And passive acoustics is pretty cool, um, but it's really challenging to interpret the data sometimes. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.